Um, I, since graduation, I became a mom to three little girls. And um, I've been working in Congress. I've worked at the White House. I've worked for an association of tech companies. I've worked for the Treasury Department. So I've had the, the DC experience. When I interviewed at the White House to be the director for the G8, uh, uh, which, uh, there was a G8 then. Um, <laughs> Con Condoleezza Rice said that she'd offered me the job as long as I promised to speak up. So I've been trying to speak up ever since. Um, I'm here to speak up on something that I fear will not be eradicated before my little girls are working age, and that's gender bias in the workplace. So I'm gonna outline why gender bias is not just bad for me, my girls, but it's actually bad for all of us. And then I'm gonna out suggest three hacks to cut gender bias in the business world. So I'll start with the story that Bill Gates has recounted. Um, he was speaking in Saudi Arabia to a gender segregated office, so um, to audience. So on the left was 80% of the audience, it was all men. And on the right was the other 20% of the audience, all women. And during the Q&A session, a man in the audience said that Saudi Arabia wanted to become one of the top 10 countries in technology. And he asked if that was realistic. Gates replied, well, if you're not utilizing half the talent in your country, you're not going to get close to the top 10. <laughs> so gender bias in other countries may be less obvious than in Saudi Arabia, but it's still pervasive. Um, though close to 40% of American small businesses are women-led, less than 5% of venture capital goes to women-led businesses. Um, though women make up slightly more than half the world's population and 30% of leading MBA programs like Haas, um, only 4.6% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Um, so why should someone in business who isn't a woman uh, care about gender bias? Um, two words, bottom line. Uh, return on equity is 53% higher for companies that have the most women on their boards. And one study showed that for companies that rely on innovation, female representation in top management improved financial performance by $35 million on average. That's a lot of money. So if financial performance is better for companies that fully integrate women, why is the inclusion of women still a problem? Well, gender bias is deeply embedded. It's a cognitive shortcut, but there are three hacks we can implement to cut our own biases. One is actively recruit women. So don't just look at self-promoters because there's a confidence gap between men and women. Studies show that women applied for a promotion only when they met 100% of the qualifications, and men applied for a promotion when they met 50% of the qualifications. <laughs> And even when men and women produce the same quality work, men overestimate their abilities and women underestimate theirs. And if you don't know any women who'd be interested in the job, network through organizations or tap into the networks of women who are in a similar job. Dan Rooney, who's the chairman of my husband's favorite football team, the Pittsburgh Steelers, proposed an NFL rule that requires every team with a coach or general manager opening to interview at least one minority candidate. Since the Rooney Rule was implemented 11 years ago, 17 teams have had a minority head coach or general manager. That's well more than double the number of teams in the, the preceding 80 years. So you can develop your own Rooney Rule and commit to interview a substantial number of women for each position. Two, set clear, unbiased hiring criteria, because people manage what they measure. We can establish transparent criteria to evaluate candidates before we interview one person. And then we can make sure our hiring decisions are made based on those criteria. One study showed that a resume for a faculty position was deemed worthy of hiring 73% of the time when it had a male name on top. And the exact same resume was deemed worthy of hiring 45% of the time when it had a female name on top. So clear criteria help destroy this type of bias. I wish there was clear criteria when I, and I interviewed with an international company. The man who interviewed me, um, he said that he thought he, I was great, but he couldn't offer me the job 
Um, but then he asked if I'd be interested in meeting his son instead. <laughs> so, and I'm certain he wouldn't have, uh, he wasn't sending up a form ranking my potential. Um, and the third is be a champion. So vouch for the competence of women leaders in your organization. If you describe her accomplishments, you can help overcome ingrained bias. Champion her in meetings, in the press, and with clients. When my current boss, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Ed Royce, he references his legislation to help bring um, electricity to the 600 million people in Africa who currently lack electricity. And when he mentions the bill, he often mentions my work on the bill. And that gives companies and advocacy groups a point of contact, but it also reinforces that when I discuss the Electrify Africa Act, I'm reflecting his vision. In both the Senate and the House of Representatives, I've had the opportunity to see policies around the world that integrate women in their growth and poverty reduction strategies. Women in developing countries reinvest an average of 90% of their income in their families. And that compares to men's reinvestment rate in developing countries of only 30 to 40%. So women's investments lead to better health and education outcomes, and it helps save lives and create markets. So finally, um, reducing gender bias isn't just good for women, it's good for men, it's good for the world, and it's good for clearly for business. It's my hope that using active recruitment, transparent hiring criteria, and championship of women, that we can close the gender gaps closest to us. Thank you.